Hello, everyone. Uh, welcome and uh, good day. Uh, my name is Michael Yeaman. Um, we're here with the Gutty Jackson Charitable Foundation, um, really appreciating your time and, and uh, interest in another one of the breakout sessions. The online breakout session series is something the foundation is uh, um, hosting to help provide information and education uh, wherever possible to NMOSD patients, caregivers, families, and all stakeholders. We really appreciate your uh, support and uh, welcome you. Uh, today, we have a very important uh, breakout session that focuses on the approved therapeutics. And we have uh, a, a very nice program for you that we'll uh, describe in just a moment. As always, for your consideration, um, we wanted to just outline a few of the uh, the perspectives. First, uh, of course, the foundation is delighted to share um, information and education uh, that relates to NMOSD. It's one of its primary missions, and we're very happy to do that. The information that you'll hear today in this webinar reflects published information you can find in the public domain, as well as expert opinion from our industry colleagues. And we have some very expert uh, folks with us today. Um, of course, the foundation does not provide clinical guidance or healthcare recommendations uh, regarding diagnosis or treatment, dietary or lifestyle practices, prescriptions, or any other sort of direct healthcare um, advice. Please, as always, consult your NMOSD specialist for your healthcare advice. Um, and I'm sure uh, you know um, your, uh, your resources in that regard. So again, we have a very important and special program for you today. We've got three speakers. Uh, Maureen Mealy, uh, Field Medical Affairs Director from Horizon, uh, formerly Viela Baya. Uh, we have Tiffany Berwalt, uh, Senior Manager of Marketing Analysis and Strategy from Genentech. And Yuri Edwards, Medical Director, US Medical Affairs Neurology from Alexion. The way we'll do this is we'll ask each of the speakers to present a, a brief uh, presentation of about 15 minutes. And then after each speaker, we'll have some specific questions that you all have sent in that we'll ask the speakers to address. And we'll ask each of the speakers to address the same set of questions, but relative to the drug from their company. So we're gonna get a very good uh, set of information that should be highly useful to all patients uh, on this webinar. So with that, let's start with uh, Maureen. And uh, Maureen, of course, is here from Horizon. Um, you all know about Ablizna and the drug Inabulizumab. So Maureen, please, if you would uh, provide your presentation. Thank you so much. Thank you, Michael, and uh, thank you to everybody who's out there listening in and interested in hearing about the three approved therapies. And of course, thank you to the Gutty Jackson Foundation for uh, giving us the opportunity. So as uh, you heard from Dr. Uh, Yaman, Viela Bio is now Horizon Therapeutics. Uh, this is just as of last week, there was a, a recent acquisition of Viela Bio, which uh, we're very excited about because we think that uh, joined together, we will have resources to uh, really help in the field and, and ultimately help the patients. And just to give you a flavor of, um, of Horizon, I want to quickly read this. At Horizon, we believe science and compassion must work together to transform lives. Our mission to deliver medicines for rare autoimmune and severe inflammatory diseases and provide compassionate support comes from our strong and simple philosophy to make a meaningful difference for patients and the communities in need. And so uh, since I'm given the good fortune of going first, it gives me an opportunity to first highlight uh, NMOSD disease state. And then of course, we'll get into our, our trial itself. So what is NMOSD? If you or a loved one is uh, right now living with NMOSD, you know quite well that this is a rare recurring autoimmune disease of the central nervous system that preferentially targets the optic nerves and the spinal cord and can lead to uh, in 
increasing disability over time, including trouble with vision, with walking, tremendous pain, bowel and bladder dysfunction, and all of this uh, can cause an impact on how you live your daily life. And we do know that the, certainly the, the vast majority of disability accrues with each attack. And so mitigating the risk of an attack is an important component uh, to, um, to controlling this disease. So the demographics for NMOSD are always evolving uh, as we get smarter and smarter, uh, but the most, the most uh, recent data suggests that about 15,000 people in the United States currently have this disease. We know that about nine women for every one man is affected, and also those of African and Asian uh, descent are overrepresented. The median age for diagnosis is 40 years, but it's, uh, or I should say for disease onset, but it's really quite a, a wide array of ages that can be affected by this disease. 80% of patients are seropositive for the aquaporin-4 antibodies. Aquaporin-4 is a protein that all of us have in us. Uh, it helps with the conduction of water across cell membranes. And in these patients who have NMO SD, they develop antibodies to this otherwise benign protein. So now we'll talk about the inebolizumab uh, trial data from the N-Momentum pivotal trial. This uh, trial was conducted in 230 patients. And as you can see there, the vast majority of those patients, 213, were seropositive for the aquaporin-4 antibody. Uh, all the potential relapses were evaluated and uh, were were determined by an adjudication committee to uh, strengthen the robustness of our endpoint. And uh, the use of immunosuppressive agents was prohibited in this study. So how does, uh, how does this affect, uh, how does this work? So uplisna is a highly specific uh, B cell depleter. Uh, it targets a range of B cells which play an important role in NMOSD. And the clinical trial, uh, uh, the treatment with uplisna did not, the, we found that it did not cause an increased risk of infection. And the most common side effects that were seen included urinary tract infections, joint pain, headache, and back pain. Uh, importantly, infusion reactions were seen in less than 10% of patients exposed to the medication. And how is it dosed? Uh, patients receive uplisna at day one and again at day 15, and then a single dose every six months thereafter during a 90 minute infusion. Uh, patients are also given pre-medications to mitigate the risk of infusion reactions, including steroids, acetaminophen, and antihistamines. And what we found in our trial is that uh, the occurrence of relapses were significantly reduced uh, for the seropositive, aquaporin-4 seropositive patient population. In fact, the, the, the relative risk reduction was 77% at just six months uh, of further randomized controlled trial, such that 89% of patients were relapse-free at that point, and 58% of patients were relapse-free who received placebo. Also, there was a significant decrease in hospitalization among the aquaporin-4 seropositive patients. In fact, there was a 78% relative reduction in hospitalizations uh, compared to placebo. So of course, I uh, have to do my due diligence and encourage you to ask questions to your healthcare provider. It's so important to have that conversation before starting this medication, before starting any medication, including, uh, I'll highlight a couple of them here, how the medication works, what tests I would need prior to starting medication or while on medication, uh, how it affects other medications I might be on, and uh, side effects that you could experience on these medications.
And obviously, of course, importantly for any NMO patient, regardless of, of what therapy you're on, uh, new and, and worsening symptoms need to be discussed with your healthcare provider. So in these subsequent slides, uh, I'll be talking about important safety information. This information is readily available um, through either uplizna.com or through the FDA website. And so, but I still do want to highlight some important points that uh, perhaps haven't already been discussed. Uh, so for example, who should not receive uplizna? You should not receive uplizna if you've had a life-threatening infusion reaction to uplizna, if you have active hepatitis B uh, infection, if you have active or uh, under or untreated previous uh, tuberculosis infection, and uh, if you've had recent vaccinations, if you're pregnant, if you're breastfeeding, if you plan to become pregnant, these are all reasons you need to uh, discuss with your healthcare provider before formulating a plan. Uh, also importantly, um, infections need to be monitored by you and by your healthcare provider. We know that uh, that modulating the immune system can predispose people to infection risk. And though it was not seen in the study, it is something to be very alert about uh, in terms of uh, increased risk. And so being diligent about reporting sore throat, uh, uh, urinary frequency or, um, or pain is uh, those types of things are important to, 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 to disclose to your doctor as you have them. Um, we also do know that uh, infusion reactions can occur, and while mild in the study, it, we, again, are cognizant that it is certainly a risk to that uh, can exist with taking these therapies. And so um, patients are monitored for one hour following each uh, treatment with aplizna. Progressive uh, multifocal leukoencephalopathy. So PML may happen with uplizna. It is a, uh, a rare infection that can cause severe disability and even death and symptoms are neurologic in their presentation. So um, it's important to be diligent to not only report symptoms that are consistent with NMO, but also those neurologic uh, symptoms that are perhaps atypical for NMO. Uh, again, TB uh, is caused by uh, an infection in the lung, and so you do need to be screened for it because of the risks of, uh, that can occur. Um, vaccinations, certain vaccinations, specifically live or live attenuated vaccinations, are not recommended in people receiving uplizna. And of course, whenever you receive any uplizna, you need to discuss that plan with your provider. Um, and also, there may be some monitoring at uh, your healthcare provider's discretion of, uh, of blood cell counts. Uh, so, so this is laboratory monitoring. And the plan can really be individualized uh, in a conversation with your healthcare provider. Now, I know I covered a lot of information quite quickly, but if you do have any additional questions uh, at the end of this entire session, I encourage you to be in touch with B. McLucas. Uh, B. McLucas works in patient advocacy, and this is her email address listed here. And again, I want to uh, thank the Guthy Jackson Foundation for giving us the opportunity to be here today. And additionally, um, you know, I thank you for your support, not only of the three companies, but also of healthcare providers and, and most certainly of patients themselves. Thank you. Maureen, thank you so much. Uh, very, uh, very helpful information. And now Maureen, why don't we just um, move into the sort of conversational uh, questions and answers part. The questions have come in from patients and uh, we'll kind of just go through them. Uh, so let me just start, uh, Maureen. First, um, the, one of the, the real questions is, do patients need to stop their current treatment uh, for a certain amount of time before starting a blizna? Uh, yeah, so that's a very appropriate concern. A blizna was studied as a monotherapy, so as to provide a clear answer about magnitude of effect 
uh, independent of other treatments, meaning that trial participants were not permitted to be on other uh, immunomodulators during the, the course of the study. As such, we have very limited data about how the transition, how to transition patients uh, from their current medi medication to Uplisna in a manner that mitigates the risk of an attack. Uh, we do know that Uplisna begins to reduce B cell counts in the blood within eight days following the first infusion. Uh, in the end momentum clinical trial, B cell counts were reduced below the lower limit of normal by four weeks in 100% of the participants uh, and remained below the lower limit of normal in 94% at 28 weeks when you're due for your next infusion. And this is reflected in the label. Uh, of note, for entry into the trial, there was no washout of mycophenolate or azathioprine prior to enrollment, meaning that patients transitioned from these medications to Uplisna directly and no safety concerns emerged. However, uh, in order to have really a clear understanding of the, of the effect of this drug, patients couldn't have received rituximab for at least six months prior to enrollment. But ultimately, your prescriber would be best suited for making a plan with you for how and when to switch agents um, based on the mechanism of action, the effects on the immune system, and, and taking into account each individual patient. Okay, Maureen, thanks a lot. And let me just turn that question a little bit the other way. And that is, I think you mentioned, if a patient is already on other treatments, can Uplisna simply be added to those other treatments? So uh, um, again, it was tested as a monotherapy. We showed efficacy as a monotherapy. So um, we were able to show an impact on the on relapses as a single agent therapy. And so again, there's very little information about, we do know that you, um, that oftentimes increasing the number of immunosuppressants can have an increased risk of infections. And so um, that needs to be considered when you're, you and your healthcare provider make a plan. But um, importantly, the label of Uplisna is as a monotherapy. Got it. Thank you so much, Maureen. And that kind of leads us into the, the next question uh, that has a little bit to do with, um, you know, Uplisna is approved and that took a, an important set of clinical trial um, data, et cetera. But patients, you know, often ask why is, you know, using Uplisna as an approved drug perhaps better than using a drug that might have the same target or mechanism of action? that's not approved? Sure. Well, first and foremost, I can't say that Uplisna is any better or worse than any other uh, a ther therapy, whether it's approved or not, since there have been no direct comparison trials uh, with any other medication. Uh, while the mechanisms of action of rituxan and Uplisna are similar in that they both target B cells, they're not the same. Um, Uplisna targets CD19 positive B cells rather than CD20 cells. This is an important distinction because plasma blasts and some plasma cells, the cells that produce the aquaporin-4 antibodies, express CD19 and largely don't express CD20. And so in other words, uh, Uplisna directly targets the cells that make aquaporin-4 antibodies. Um, some other factors that differentiate these two molecules are that rituxan is chimeric, uh, whereas Uplisna is humanized. The, the major difference between chimeric and humanized antibodies is the extent of amino acids of uh, rodent origin used in the molecule. So in general, chimeric antibodies have a higher risk for allergic reaction. Most importantly, perhaps, is that we have rigorous data in a relatively large cohort of patients with NMOSD to support its use. And uh, data to support use of, of other B cell depleters was largely not well controlled or uh, studies were underpowered, meaning they didn't have enough participants to give us a clear understanding of the efficacy. Uh, at least as important is that it was found uh, under these same rigorous conditions to be safe in patients with NMOSD with over four years of data now. Uh, no trial has been conducted in NMOSD with any other B cell depleter that would lend itself to the uh, rigorous 
a regulatory review, such as through the FDA, uh, towards the effort of having approval. Great, Maureen. And that kind of brings us to one of the questions about safety um, that patients are often interested in. What are the risks of infection with Uplisna? I know you mentioned PML, but if you could just address that as well. Thank you. Sure. So the risk for infection was similar between participants who received placebo as with Uplisna during the randomized controlled period, and, and no additional infectious concerns uh, attributed to the medication were uncovered during the open label uh, extension period, which, uh, so that's up to four years of treatment. And that was recently presented uh, at a conference. PML uh, is, as we've talked about, it's an opportunistic viral infection of the brain caused by the JC virus that typically only occurs in patients who are immunocompromised and that, uh, as I mentioned, can lead to death or severe disability. Uh, JC virus infection resulting in PML has been observed in patients with other B-cell depleting antibodies and, and other therapies that affect immune competence, including rituxan. Uh, and however, no confirmed cases of PML were identified in Uplisna clinical trials. Nonetheless, uh, diligent monitoring of your neurologic status by your healthcare provider is necessary because there is a risk. Uh, typical symptoms associated with PML, some of which we, we I uh, briefly mentioned, but uh, are progress over days to weeks and include progressive weakness on one side of the body or clumsiness of the limbs, uh, disturbance of vision, changes in uh, thinking, memory, uh, disorientation uh, that leads to uh, confusion and even personality changes. So at the first sign or symptom suggestive of PML, Uplisna should be withheld and appropriate diagnostic evaluation should be performed by your healthcare provider. Thanks a lot, Maureen. And we'll, for the next few questions, we'll try to, you know, move a little bit um, more quickly. So okay. one of the questions has to do with who can use Uplisna. So uh, is the drug safe and effective in young adults? Let's say somebody who's 20 years old, just beyond pediatric age, if you will. Uh, what's your thought about that, Maureen? Yeah. So. Uh, and momentum included participants as young as 18, and overall, Uplisna was found to be effective in adult patients seropositive for aquaporin-4. Now, despite being the largest trial in NMOSD, there were not enough patients, younger patients, to examine this subset of patients separately. However, because there's no expectation that a younger adult cohort would respond differently to the medication compared to the study population as a whole, it's approved for use in all AQP4 zero, uh, AQP4 zero positive patients that are 18 and over. Great, thank you. And then um, in terms of uh, routine monitoring uh, or other testing that's necessary with Uplisna, can you give us uh, a quick uh, rundown on that and how often that monitoring is needed. Sure. Sure. So Uplisna hasn't been shown to uh, affect or damage the liver or the kidneys. So there's no uh, routine monitoring that's advised per se. But prior to your first dose, your healthcare provider will screen for hepatitis B, uh, quantitative serum immunoglobulins, and tuberculosis. And in addition, your healthcare provider will determine if it's necessary to monitor your immunoglobulins um, or other types of cells that can be affected by this drug as needed. There's not a, a specific uh, frequency and it, it really can be individualized based on patient uh, and provider's uh, own plans and risks. Great. Uh, in terms of um, uh, treatment um, dosing, how well tolerated is Uplisnite? We know you, you mentioned it, but do you, is pre-medication necessary, for example, to avoid uh, adverse reactions? Yeah, so the pivotal trial um, showed adverse, adverse events or side effects to be similar uh, between participants treated with Uplisna and those treated with placebo. And that does include the infusion reactions. Uh, in fact, no side effects uh, to the infusion itself were reported in 96% of the doses given throughout the whole randomized controlled and open label extension components of the trial. 
Um, no serious allergic reactions were seen, and the full dose was administered 99.5% of the time, and these data were all recently presented at a conference. Um, all participants receiving pre-medications, as, as we discussed, uh, uh, they do require, uh, and upliznet has only been given in this way, such that patients receive an antihistamine like Benadryl, an antipyretic like Tylenol, and a small steroid dose to reduce the occurrence or severity of infusion reactions, and that's consistent with the label. Uh, the most commonly occurring infusion reactions were headache, nausea, and sleepiness. Great, thank you. Can aplisna be used during pregnancy or in patients who have a comorbid autoimmune disease, Maureen? So patients with uh, overlapping autoimmune disease were able to be included in the end momentum study if the other autoimmune disease was well controlled at the time of enrollment. However, uh, the efficacy of aplisna was only tested for NMOSD and ability to control other autoimmune diseases is unknown. Um, regarding pregnancy, pregnant women were not included in the trial and it is uh, not known if uplisna will harm your unborn baby. So as such, females of reproductive potential should use effective contraception during treatment and for six months following treatment. Uh, we're committed to uh, contributing to a post-approval registry uh, that can enable us to gain knowledge uh, about those on Uplisna, including these special populations. Thanks, Maureen. And last but not least, of course, does uh, Horizon have a program to assist patients in gaining access to Uplisna? Yes, uh, Viela VIPs is the name of our program. It offers support at every step of the patient uh, treatment journey. And the Viela VIPs team can help with enrollment in uh, one of two programs that offer financial assistance. And the first being the copay assistance program, which may help eligible individuals who are prescribed treatments with medic medication through uh, our company, Horizon Therapeutics. Uh, the program helps with drug-related out-of-pocket expenses, such as copays and coinsurance. And then the second is the PAP program, patient assistance program, may help individuals who do not have health insurance or are insufficiently covered. Uh, individuals who meet eligibility requirements may be able to receive medication at no cost for up to one year. Maureen, thank you so much. Really helpful information. Uh, we really appreciate that. We'll come back to you in just a few minutes, Maureen, okay? Thank you. Um, next, we want to uh, re uh, sort of move on to uh, the next presentation. Um, we're very fortunate to have Tiffany Bearwalt with us today from Genentech. Tiffany's a senior manager of marketing analysis and strategy. She'll talk about in spring. Tiffany, please. All right. Hi, everyone. Um, first and foremost, thank you to the Guthy Jackson Charitable Foundation and to each of you for the opportunity to speak today. My name is Tiffany and I'm on the neuroscience team at Genentech. So approximately six months ago, the FDA approved Enspring as the first and only subcutaneous treatment for adults living with AQP4 positive NMOSD. Today, my goal is to share more information about Enspring. So I'll start by sharing a short video featuring real individuals living with NMOSD. Donna, Kitsia, and Kyla will share their personal experiences, including why they chose to start treatment with Enspring. Enspring is a prescription medicine used to treat neuromyelitis optica spectrum disorder, NMOSD, in adults who are aquaporin-4, AQP4, antibody positive. It is not known if Enspring is safe and effective in children. Back when I was diagnosed, there was no approved treatment for NMO. We tried different treatments and I would have multiple relapses a year and it was scary. My symptoms were continuing to add on, like I was getting new symptoms and each time I had a relapse, it was worse. My neurologist told me about a clinical 
trial for a drug called cetralizumab, which was specifically for NMO. When my neurologist mentioned that there was a trial out there for NMO, um, I was pretty excited about it. I was more than willing to try any kind of drug study or any kind of um, new treatment that was out there because I was not happy with the way my body was. Of course, Cetralizumab is now known as Inspring. I was ready for a treatment like Inspring and my doctor thought I'd be a good candidate for it. My doctor and I went over the risks and potential benefits of the treatment. Enspring may cause serious side effects, including infections, increased liver enzymes, low neutrophil count, serious allergic reactions. The most common side effects of Enspring include sore throat, runny nose, nasopharyngitis, rash, fatigue, extremity pain, headache, upper respiratory tract infection, nausea, inflammation of the stomach lining, gastritis, joint pain, arthralgia. A doctor thought that the early trial results looked promising and that he thought I would be a good fit. I had a choice. I could stay at home in my chair or I could try something that could potentially help me manage my disease. So far, my doctor and I are happy about our results with Enspring. Of course, this is my experience. Everyone's experience is different. I felt the decision to take part in the trial was a really good one. All these years, I have had no relapses, and I'm living my life. Okay, so before I jump into this presentation here, I want to provide a quick overview of everything that I'll be sharing with you today. First, I'll share some information about Enspring and how it is thought to work. Next, I'll review the clinical trial results of Enspring. I'll then walk you through how to take Enspring, which I mentioned is the first self-administered NMO treatment you can take at home after proper guidance and training. I'll then share more about our patient support services for Enspring, and then spend some time reviewing the important safety information. So how is Enspring thought to work? Um, and first, who can take Enspring? So Enspring is approved for neuromyelitis optica spectrum disorder, or NMOSD, in AQP4 seropositive adults. The specific way that Enspring works is not completely understood, but it is thought to affect the protein interleukin-6, or IL-6. Enspring is the first treatment for NMOSD designed to block IL-6, which is a protein made by immune cells in our bodies that may play a key role in the inflammation that occurs in people with NMOSD. So Enspring is designed to block the action of that protein in your body called IL-6, which, as I mentioned previously, is believed to play a part in the, NMO, in the inflammation um, in NMOSD. Without Enspring, IL-6 connects to the cell surface via its receptor and activates the cell in that inflammation pathway. With Enspring, Enspring blocks IL-6 from connecting to the cell surface and prevents the activation of the cell. I'll now share some information and details around the clinical trial results of the Enspring. What were the goals of the Enspring clinical trials? So there were two distinct clinical trials conducted to determine whether Enspring alone or Enspring in combination with immunosuppressive therapy or other ISTs could lower the risk of relapse in adults with NMOSD versus placebo. These ISTs included azathioprine, mycophenolate mofetil, and or oral corticosteroids. Both of these two trials also measured how many patients were relapse-free at specific time points with treatment with Enspring. How was Enspring studied? So patients from countries around the world participated in the two trials, a wide range of patients in terms of age, gender, AQP4 IgG status, and the severity of the disease were represented in the clinical trials. These included both men and women, with a larger proportion of women, patients who were AQP4 IgG seropositive or AQP4 IgG seronegative, and patients with at least one confirmed relapse over the past year. As I mentioned, there were two distinct clinical trials. Study one excluded patients who were recently taking other treatments before starting the trial. And study two, on the other hand, 
only included patients who were taking certain immunosuppressive therapies, such as azathioprine, mycophenolate mofetil, or oral corticosteroids before starting the trial. Based on the number of patients who were included, NSPRING is only approved for AQP4 IgG seropositive adults. In study one, or NSPRING versus placebo, there were 95 patients included in the study who were randomly chosen to take NSPRING alone or placebo. In regards to the detailed results, um, NSPRING met the main study goal by reducing the risk of relapse and resulted in more AQP4 positive pa adult patients who were relapse free at 96 weeks or approximately two years. What this means in terms of the numbers is that in adult AQP4 positive patients who took NSPRING, NSPRING significantly reduced the risk of relapse by 74% versus placebo. And more patients were relapse free at 96 weeks or approximately two years with NSPRING versus placebo. 77% of AQP4 positive patients on NSPRING were relapse free at two years versus only 41% with placebo. In the second study, or NSPRING plus those immunosuppressive therapies that I mentioned earlier versus placebo plus those immunosuppressive therapies alone, and there were 76 patients included in the study and they were randomly chosen to take NSPRING with ISTs or placebo with ISTs. Again, NSPRING met the main study goal by reducing the risk of relapse and resulted in more AQP4 positive patients who were relapse free at approximately two years. In adult AQP4 positive patients on NSPRING with immunosuppressive therapies, NSPRING significantly reduced the risk of relapse by 78% versus placebo. And more patients were relapse free at approximately two years with NSPRING versus placebo plus ISTs. 91% of AQP4 positive patients on NSPRING plus immunosuppressive therapies were relapse free at two years versus 57% of patients taking placebo plus ISTs alone. How is NSPRING taken? We'll go through those details right now. Um, as you can see here, we have a mock-up image of what the NSPRING pre-filled syringe and carton looks like. Um, An NSPRING treatment can be self-administered. NSPRING is intended for home use or elsewhere under the guidance of a healthcare professional. Um, and after proper training in subcutaneous injection technique, an adult patient or their caregiver may self-inject NSPRING if your HCP or doctor determines that that is appropriate. There are numerous resources available to understand how to properly administer NSPRING. And many of these resources are available at nspring.com including a video with details on how to self-administer NSPRING to reinforce and refresh the techniques you learn from your healthcare provider. In regards to dosing, NSPRING is a quick sub subcutaneous injection given under the skin once a month via a pre-filled syringe. Initiating NSPRING requires three starting doses administered at two-week intervals. When you begin NSPRING, you'll administer your initial starting dose, two weeks later, your second starting dose, and two weeks after that, your third starting dose. After those starting doses, ongoing doses are taken every four weeks. In regards to storage and handling, um, NSPRING does require a refrigeration. However, NSPRING can be unrefrigerated for a maximum combined time of eight days. This allows you to take or administer NSPRING in a location that is most appropriate for you at the time. I'll now share some information about our patient support programs for NSPRING. Our focus on patients extends to the programs we've created to help patients get the Genentech medicine that they've been prescribed. Once you and your doctor have decided that NSPRING might be the right treatment for you, we have programs that can help based on your unique needs as individuals living with NMO. So NSPRING Access Solutions is the place to turn for answers and support. We offer a number of support services, including a patient navigator, who is your personal guide throughout your treatment with NSPRING, supplemental injection training and support, as well as financial assistance to help with the cost of your NSPRING. Your patient navigator works with you and your doctor's office and or specialty pharmacy to help get your medicine. 
They can explain how insurance can cover and spring treatment. They can also help you find financial assistance options to enroll and navigate the Enspring copay program if you're eligible. They're available to answer questions about Enspring and can teach you about the Enspring supplemental injection training. You should feel supported along your entire journey and, um, with Enspring. So you can reach out to a patient navigator at 844-ENSPRING without the E, um, which is 844-677-7964. All of this information um, and the ability to enroll is also available at enspring.com. We can also help with the cost of your medicine. Genentech is committed to helping you get the Enspring your doctors prescribed. And your patient navigator can help find assistance options to help you pay for Enspring. If you have a commercial insurance plan, you may be able to use the Enspring copay program. If you have commercial or public insurance plans, such as Medicare or Medicaid, you may be referred to an independent copay assistance foundation. And if you have no insurance coverage or can't pay for your medicine, the Genentech Patient Foundation may be able to help. There may be options um, that can help you afford your Genentech medicine, no matter what type of health insurance that you have. We also offer injection training support. So Enspring clinical education managers provide supplemental injection training to patients or caregivers to ensure that they're prepared to administer Enspring. Clinical injection managers do not inject patients with Enspring. However, they can set up a free one-on-one -on -one virtual injection training visit and provide ongoing injection training support throughout your Enspring treatment journey. Again, call 844-ENSPRING without the E um, or enroll online at www.enspring.com. I will now share some important safety information about Enspring. Um, as I mentioned earlier, Enspring is a prescription medicine used to treat neuromyelitis optica spectrum disorder in adults who are AQP4 antibody positive. It is not currently known if Enspring is safe and effective in children. You should not take Enspring if you are allergic to Enspring or any of the ingredients in Enspring, have an active hepatitis B infection, have active or untreated inactive tuberculosis. Um, the most important information you should know about Enspring is that Enspring can cause serious side effects, including infections. Enspring can increase your risk of serious infections, some of which can be life-threatening. Talk to your healthcare provider if you are being treated for an infection or call them right away if you think you have signs of an infection with or without a fever, such as chills, feeling tired, muscle aches and a cough that will not go away, um, skin redness, swelling, diarrhea, belly pain, feeling sick or burning where, when you urinate or urinating more than usual. Your healthcare provider will check if you have an infection and treat it if needed before you start or continue to take Enspring. Your healthcare provider should also test you for hepatitis and tuberculosis before you start Enspring. All required vaccinations should be completed before starting Enspring. People using Enspring should not be given live or live attenuated vaccines. These vaccines should be given at least four weeks before you start Enspring. Your doctor may recommend that you get a non-live or inactivated vaccine, such as some of the seasonal flu vaccines. And if you plan to get one of these non-live or inactivated vaccines, it should be given whenever possible, at least two weeks before you start Enspring. Enspring may also cause increased liver enzymes. Your healthcare provider should order blood tests to check your liver enzymes before and while you're taking Enspring. And they'll tell you how often you need to take these blood tests. Enspring may also cause low neutrophil count, um, which can decrease uh, or can cause a decrease in the neutrophil counts in your blood. Neutrophils are the white blood cells that help the body fight off bacterial infections and your healthcare provider should order blood tests to check your neutrophil count while you're taking Enspring. Enspring can also cause serious allergic reactions. These reactions um, may be life-threatening and have happened with other medicines that are similar to Enspring. Tell your healthcare provider right away before taking your next dose if you've had hives, rash, flushing um, after your injection. Seek medical treatment right away if you have any symptoms of a serious allergic reaction. And before you take Enspring, you should tell your healthcare provider about all of your medical conditions, including if you have or think you have an infection, have had liver problems, 
have ever had hepatitis B or are a carrier of the hepatitis B virus, have had or been in contact with someone with tuberculosis, have had a recent vaccination or are scheduled to receive any vaccination, are pregnant, think you might be pregnant or plan to become pregnant as it is not known if N-Spring will harm your unborn baby. You should also tell your healthcare provider about all the medicines that you're currently taking, including prescription and over-the-counter medicines, vitamins, and herbal supplements. In regards to the most common side effects of N-Spring, um, these include sore throat or runny nose, rash, fatigue, extremity pain, headache, upper respiratory tract infection, nausea, inflammation of the stomach lining, and joint pain. And so with all that important, um, very important safety information, um, that brings me to all I have for you today. Um, and I know that a ton of information was just shared, so don't worry if you feel like you missed something. Um, you can find more information about Enspring, including everything that I just shared with you in this presentation at enspring.com. Um, and so with that, thank you so much again. Tiffany, thank you very much. We'll now move into the same questions we asked before, but now specifically focused on InSpring. Um, so the first question uh, has to do with, um, do patients need to be off of their current or prior therapy before starting InSpring? So we encourage you to have an open dialogue with, with your healthcare provider to discuss the risks and the benefits of switching to InSpring. You may be able to continue taking your current treatment depending on which drug you're taking. Um, so as I mentioned in my presentation, in study two, patients taking Enspring continue to also take certain immunosuppressive therapies during the trial. These therapies included azathioprine, mycophenolate mofetil, and or corticosteroids. Your healthcare provider will help determine the most appropriate way to use Enspring, whether that's alone or with certain immunosuppressive therapies. And so just to, to follow up on that, sort of the other side of the question, if someone is already on one of those therapies you mentioned, can they start uh, Enspring? Again, talk to your healthcare provider um, about the potential risks of either um, adding Enspring to your current therapy or switching to Enspring. Um, our trial results was designed um, and included patients who were taking certain immunosuppressive therapies prior to and while they were taking Enspring. Um, and so your healthcare provider will help determine the most appropriate way to use Enspring, whether that is Enspring alone or with certain immunosuppressive therapies. Great, Tiffany, thank you. Um, the next sort of question has to do with, you know, Enspring, of course, is one of the approved therapies. Why is Enspring being approved better than other medicines that might have the same target or mechanism of action but are not approved for NMOSD? So I cannot comment on how Enspring compares directly to other therapies as no head-to-head -head clinical trials have been conducted. However, while Enspring and tocilizumab have the same target, they are two distinctly different molecules. The engineering of Enspring is designed to block IL-6 signaling and be self-administered every four weeks. Tocilizumab is also not approved for the treatment of NMOSD as there is no global randomized control studies to support the efficacy and safety in NMOSD populations. Thanks a lot, Tiffany. Um, moving on to the risks of infection, I know you went through that uh, pretty carefully. Could you just add any other comments you might have regarding the question from patients? What are the risks of infection with Enspring, including PML? There is no PML risk associated with Enspring. Enspring can, however, increase your risk of serious infections, some of which can be life-threatening. Talk to your healthcare provider if you're being treated for an infection or call them right away if you think you have signs of an infection. Your doctor will check if you have an infection and treat it if needed before you start or continue to take Enspring. And Tiffany, you mentioned um, whom can uh, be prescribed uh, Enspring, but could you just address this question also? Is your drug safe and effective in young adults let's say persons who are just beyond pediatric age, say 20 years old, for example. So Enspring has been FDA approved for use in AQP4 positive adults who are 18 years and older. And while eight adolescent patients aged um, 13 through 17 were enrolled in Enspring's clinical study too, 
the FDA determined that safety and efficacy cannot be evaluated in adolescents given the population size within that clinical trial. Okay, thank you. And regarding monitoring or blood work, can you just uh, add anything to what you've already said regarding you know, routine monitoring or other testing that might be necessary uh, within spring? And if so, how often? Sure. So your doctor will check if you have an infection and treat it if needed before you start or continue to take N-Spring. And they should test you for hepatitis and tuberculosis before you start taking N-Spring. Your doctor should also order blood tests to check your liver enzymes before and while you're taking N-Spring. And they'll let you know how often you need to have these blood tests. In addition, your doctor should order blood tests to check your neutrophil count while you're taking N-Spring. Tiffany, during the injection administration um, or prior to it, is any pre-medication necessary to avoid adverse reactions and is the drug well tolerated? So no pre-medications are required before the administration of Enspring. Great. Um, and then you mentioned again uh, a little bit about this topic, but one of the questions that is uh, important to patients can Enspring be used during pregnancy uh, or in patients who have an autoimmune disease in addition to an MOSD? So in regards to pregnancy, there is no adequate data on the developmental risk associated with the use of Enspring in pregnant women. Therefore, before you take Enspring, tell your doctor if you are pregnant, think you might be pregnant or plan to become pregnant. In regards to having more than one autoimmune disease, um, there are no specific studies designed to assess Enspring in patients with more than one autoimmune condition or for use in combination with other medications for such diseases. As such, patients with more than one autoimmune disease should talk to their doctor about their specific conditions and what treatment might be right for them. That being said, Enspring is not contraindicated in patients with other autoimmune conditions. And in fact, there were 31 patients enrolled in the Enspring studies with concomitant autoimmune diseases. And these most commonly reported um, autoimmune diseases were Sjogren syndrome, systematic lupus um, erythematosus. Um, and in those NMO patients with concomitant autoimmune diseases, Enspring demonstrated comparable safety and efficacy to the overall study populations. Thanks for that info, Tiffany. And then lastly, but of course not least, you did cover some of the programs that Genentech has for uh, providing access to patients, but could you just say anything else about um, you know, what assistance programs there might be for uh, patients to access Enspring? Absolutely. So as I mentioned earlier, Genentech is committed to helping you get the Enspring that your doctor prescribed. And Enspring Access Solutions is the place to turn for answers and support. We offer a number of support services, including a patient navigator who's your personal guide throughout your treatment with Enspring, supplemental injection training and support, and financial assistance to help with the cost of your medicine. And so once you and your doctor have decided that Enspring might be the right treatment for you, your personal patient navigator is available to help you find assistance options so that you can help um, or that can help you pay for your end spring. And there may be options um, that can help you afford your Genentech medicine, no matter what type of health insurance you have. And so you can reach out to a Genentech Access Solutions patient navigator at 844-ENDSPRING or endspring.com um, and find more information there. Tiffany, thank you so much. Uh, we really appreciate the information. We'll come back to you in a few minutes, okay? Thanks a lot. Thank you. Next, uh, let's move forward. And we want to welcome uh, Yuri Edwards, uh, Medical Director, U.S. Medical Affairs Neurology from Alexion, to tell us more about Solaris. Uh, Yuri, please. Michael, thank you very much for the introduction and for the opportunity. And welcome to managing neuromyelitis optica spectrum disorder through complement inhibition. 
Thank you very much for attending this event and thank you very much for uh, Guthy Jackson Foundation's invitation to present uh, important information about uh, NMOSD and about available treatment options for this disorder. Alexion is the maker of an FDA approved treatment for adults with anti-aquaporin 4 or AQP4 antibody positive NMOSD. And uh, the content in this presentation intended as educational information uh, for patients and their caregivers. This information is intended as, uh, uh, does not represent a medical uh, opinion or doctor uh, or doctor's medical judgment. And we encourage you to speak with your treating physicians to confirm a treatment plan and uh, design a clinical approach to your disorder. It is, uh, very important to note that the prescribing information for uh, our therapy is available on the Alexian website. I'm going to start by talking a little bit about Alexian and uh, its commitment to the NMOSD community. Then I'm going to uh, talk a little bit about NMOSD and the complement system, which is an important part of your immune response that, uh, when uncontrolled, plays an important role in the damage seen in NMOSD. And lastly, we'll discuss a treatment option that may help reduce your risk of NMOSD relapse. So you have heard already a lot of information about what NMOSD is, but uh, originally this disorder was discovered back in 1894, and it was first called Devix disease. It took over 100 years before the diagnostic criteria for NMOSD were developed. Uh, in 2007, Alexian received its first approval for a complement inhibitor therapy that in 2019 was also FDA approved to treat adults with anti-AQP4 antibody positive NMOSD. Alexian's complement inhibitor therapy has been uh, FDA approved to treat four different complement related diseases. It has been studied in more than 50 clinical trials with more than 50,000 patient years of safety and efficacy data. Patient years are calculated by multiplying the number of patients being observed by the number of years of observation. For example, if a clinical trial followed 100 patients for one year each, it would equal 100 patient years. Or if uh, the trial followed 25 patients for four years each, uh, you'd also get 100 patient years. Post-market experience is uh, defined as the length of time that has passed since uh, the therapy has been approved by the FDA for its original indication. In total, Alexian has five FDA-approved medicines that treat seven rare diseases and conditions, including anti-AQP4 antibody-positive NMOSD in adults. So what is NMOSD? It's an autoimmune disease that causes your immune system to attack uh, your central nervous system. These attacks are also known as relapses. They are unpredictable and may be severe and recurrent, primarily causing damage to your nerves uh, in the optic tract and the spinal cord. What are antibodies and why are they uh, important uh, in NMOSD? Around 73% of uh, patients with NMOSD have the anti-AQP4 antibody. An antibody is something uh, that your immune system produces to help fight off anything that your body thinks is a foreign or dangerous matter. In anti-AQP4 antibody positive NMOSD, the anti-AQP4 antibodies cause your Im immune system to attack your C CNS instead. These antibodies uh, comp uh, activate complement system, and uh, they uh, such, uh, and therefore they uh, protect your body from threats uh, such as certain types of infections. People with anti-AQP4 antibody positive NMOSD have a high risk of relapse. In fact, up to 93% of people with anti-AQP4 antibody positive NMOSD have relapsed during the course of their disease. In a healthy person, complement receives signals from antibodies, telling it to attack things like bacteria and other threats. In NMOSD, complement is wrongfully triggered by anti-AQP4 antibodies to attack areas of your central nervous system. 
that uncontrolled activity can cause inflammation and damage to cells in your optic nerves and spinal cord. Complement plays a crucial role in the damage found in the optic nerves and spinal cord in anti-AQP4 antibody positive and MOSD. Fortunately, there is an Alexian FDA approved treatment specifically designed to target and block complement. So Liris is the first and only FDA approved uh, drug for the treatment of adults with anti-AQP4 antibody positive NMOSD. It is prescribed uh, to treat adults with a, with a severe NMOSD who are AQP4 antibody positive. It is not known if Soliris is safe and effective in children with NMOSD. What is the most important safety information that you should know about Soliris? Soliris is a medicine that affects your immune system and can lower the ability of your immune system to fight infections. Soliris may increase your chance of getting serious and life-threatening meningococcal infections that may quickly become life-threatening and cause death if not recognized and treated early. You must receive meningococcal vaccines at least two weeks before your first dose of Soliris if you are not vaccinated. If your doctor decides that urgent treatment with Soliris is needed, you should receive meningococcal vaccination as soon as possible. If you have not been vaccinated and Soliris therapy must be initiated immediately, you should also receive two weeks of antibiotics with your vaccinations. If you had a meningococcal vaccine in the past, you might need additional vaccination your doctor will decide if you need additional vaccination. Meningococcal vaccines reduce but do not completely eliminate the risk of meningococcal infections. You need to speak with your doctor or get emergency medical care right away if you get any of these signs and symptoms that could be indicative of a meningococcal infection. These signs could include headache with nausea and or vomiting, headache and fever, headache with a stiff neck or stiff back, fever, fever accompanied by rash, confusion, muscle aches with flu-like symptoms, and eyes that are sensitive to light. So now I'm going to talk a little bit about uh, PREVENT clinical trial that led to approval of Soliris by the FDA. In the PREVENT clinical trial, uh, Soliris uh, was shown to significantly reduce the risk of relapse. Uh, for this trial, 143 adults with AQP4 antibody positive NMOSD were enrolled. 96 of them received Soliris, whereas 47 received placebo. The duration of the study was over three years. In the PREVENT trial, uh, immunosuppressive therapy is well allowed, uh, although uh, some people only received Soliris as part of their participation in the clinical trial. The goal of the study was to determine the time to first adjudicated relapse. An adjudicated relapse means that, uh, the means that an independent committee of medical experts confirmed that a relapse has indeed occurred. Soliris is only available through a program called the Soliris REMS. Before you can receive Soliris, your doctor must enroll in the Soliris REMS program, counsel you about the risk of meningococcal infection, give you information and a patient safety card about the symptoms and your risk of meningococcal infection, as mentioned before. Uh, make sure that you are vaccinated with the meningococcal vaccine, and if needed, get revaccinated with the meningococcal vaccine. Ask your doctor if you're not sure if you need to be revaccinated. So in the PREVENT clinical trial, there was a 94% reduction of relapse in patients who were treated with Soliris compared to placebo. In addition, 98% of people who received Soliris were relapse-free at 48 weeks compared to 63% uh, in the placebo group. As mentioned before, you must receive meningococcal vaccines at least two weeks before your first dose of Soliris. 
you should receive uh, a vaccine called MAN ACWY, uh, and you need to two doses of this vaccine at least eight weeks apart. In addition, one of the other two vaccines should be uh, administered as well. It could be either MAN B4C or MAN BFHBP vaccine. Uh, MAN B4C vaccine should be administered uh, with two doses at least one month apart, whereas MAN BFHBP vaccine should be administered with three doses at zero, one or two months, and then at six months. Also, make sure that uh, any necessary booster vaccines are administered with consultation with your physician. Soliris is given as an infusion through your vein. Dosing occurs in two phases. Initially, infusions are given weekly for the first four weeks, followed by a fifth dose one week later. Then infusions are given every 14 days. Your doctor will discuss the ongoing timeline of administration with you. Infusions last approximately 35 minutes in adults, plus one hour to monitor for infusion-related reactions. In addition, home infusions may be available based on your insurance coverage. Soliris was studied for over three years in patients with uh, anti-AQP4 antibody positive NMOSD in the PREVENT clinical study. The most common side effects in people with anti-AQP4 antibody positive NMOSD treated with Soliris include common cold or upper respiratory infection, pain or swelling of your throat and nose, also known as nasopharyngitis, diarrhea, back pain, dizziness, flu-like symptoms, joint pain, throat irritation, and bruising. In conclusion, uh, you cannot predict relapses with NMOSD, but you may be able to reduce the risk uh, with Soliris. Soliris is the first FDA-approved treatment for adults with anti-AQP4 antibody-positive NMOSD. In the PREVENT clinical trial, patients receiving Soliris experienced a lower risk of relapse compared to patients receiving placebo. In fact, there was a 94% reduction in risk of relapse with Soliris compared to placebo. In addition, 98% of adults treated with Soliris were relapse-free after 48 weeks compared to 63 with placebo. And the most common side effects included the common cold, uh, nasopharyngitis, diarrhea, back pain, dizziness, flu-like symptoms, joint pain, pharyngitis, and bruising. Thank you very much for joining us today. And please see full prescribing information and medication guide for Soliris, including boxed warning regarding serious meningococcal infection provided at this presentation and also available at the Alexion website. Yuri, thank you very much. Uh, we really appreciate the information. And now, um, We'll go into the same questions that we had with the other presentations, Yuri, but now focused on Soliris. First of all, uh, patients are very interested in, you know, the question, uh, do they need to be off of their current treatment for a certain amount of time before starting on Soliris? Uh, decisions about the choice of therapy in NMOSD are very important. And we recommend that you speak with your physician about uh, NMOSD and any concerns that you may have regarding the risk of relapse during treatment transition. Your treating physician should evaluate this relevant clinical information and provide their recommendations based on the criteria and details that are specific to your situation. And Yuri, I'll just ask the question the other way around as well, just for thoroughness. If a patient is already on therapies, uh, that are intended to, to help stop relapses, can Soliris simply be added to those therapies? In the PREVENT clinical trial of Soliris for NMOSD, patients could participate if they were on a stable dose regimen of immunosuppressive therapy, or if their uh, corticosteroid dose did not exceed 20 milligrams per day. 
And as I mentioned, when patients consider uh, potentially adding another drug to their therapy, uh, they should speak with their physician who will assess their clinical situation and will provide expert medical advice based on uh, important factors that have been identified. Thanks a lot, Yuri. Another question that uh, is, is important to many patients you know, why is Soliris better than drugs that are not approved for NMOSD? As we have seen already today, uh, there have not been any direct comparison studies that evaluated safety and efficacy of different drugs that have been used to treat NMOSD, both those who have been approved by the FDA and those who have been used off-label. Uh, therefore, the decision to use any specific therapy in the clinical management of this disorder will depend on many factors, and these factors should be clearly evaluated and discussed with your treating physician. Thanks, Yuri. You covered, you know, uh, potential meningococcal infection. Um, patients are also interested, are there other risks of infection with Solaris, including PML? Uh, in the PREVENT clinical trial, uh, as I mentioned, uh, the most common infections in people with anti-AQP4 antibody positive NMOSD who were treated with Solaris included common cold and nasopharyngitis. In the PREVENT clinical trial, no PML cases or cases of meningococcal infections occurred. Great. And um, with respect to who can be um, prescribed uh, Solaris, Questions uh, come in, Yuri, that relate to, um, is Solaris safe and effective in young adults, say folks who are just beyond pediatric age, let's say, for example, 20 years old? Yeah. Uh, patients who participated in our clinical trial uh, were between 36 and 50 years of age at clinical at initial clinical presentation. Uh, in the future, uh, we hope that more information may become available about the real-world use of Solaris in patients in other age groups. Uh, in the interim, you should always speak with your doctor about your NMOSD, any specific symptoms that you may be experiencing, and your treatment options. Uh, as you know, uh, Solaris has been approved for use in anti-AQP4 antibody positive NMOSD in adults starting uh, with 18 years of age. Thanks, Yuri. Um, with respect to uh, ongoing use of Solaris, is there routine monitoring or, or blood work or other tests that are needed? And if so, how often are those needed? Patients with NMOSD who receive Solaris are not routinely monitored for changes in their blood uh, or by using any other tests. Uh, in terms of the safety considerations, as I mentioned, uh, if you're experiencing any specific symptoms that might be indicative of meningococcal infection, it is important that you discuss them with your physician who would be able to conduct proper clinical evalu evaluation and diagnosis. However, any routine monitoring is not uh, required uh, for patients who receive Solaris. Thanks, Yuri. And then with respect to actual dosing, can you say a few words about how well tolerated is Solaris and is pre-medication needed to avoid uh, adverse reactions? In our clinical trials, no patients experienced an infusion reaction, which required discontinuation of Solaris. However, there is a potential risk that these infusion reactions may occur, uh, which may include hypersensitivity reactions. Therefore, if patients have had any history of allergy to any components of Solaris, they should not be receiving uh, our therapy. Uh, also, as mentioned earlier during the presentation, uh, patients must receive meningococcal vaccines at least two weeks uh, before their first dose of Solaris if they're not vaccinated. If their physician decides that urgent treatment with Solaris is needed, they should receive meningococcal vaccination as soon as possible. And finally, if they have not been vaccinated with and Solaris therapy must be initiated immediately, they should also receive two weeks of antibiotics with their vaccinations. Thanks, Yuri. And then with respect to who can use Solaris, um, patients ask, can Solaris be used during pregnancy uh, or if uh, one has uh, an autoimmune disease in addition to NMOSD? 
There are limited data on outcomes of pregnancies and patients with other autoimmune disorders based uh, on our clinical trials. Uh, pregnant women were excluded in the PREVENT trial. However, we know of uh, cases of women who became pregnant during the trial and uh, delivered their babies. Uh, these data have not identified any concerns for specific adverse developmental outcomes in pregnancies. Uh, uh, in addition, patients who receive ciliaries uh, have not been identified with any uh, additional background risk of unfavorable pregnancy outcomes to our knowledge. Great, Julian. Last but not least, of course, patients are very interested in whether Alexion has programs to assist them in gaining access to ciliaries. Alexion offers a complementary uh, personalized patient support program that is called OneSource. Uh, OneSource is designed to support specific needs of patients with NMOSD. Uh, this program can support patients with uh, disease information, health insurance navigation, and community connections, as well as ongoing support while traveling or during various life changes. OneSource has been designed to serve as a bridge uh, between the patient and their physician to ensure that the integrity of their treatment plan has, is maintained. Uh, we have uh, one source case managers who can serve as a valuable resource along your patient journey. Uh, they can help in several important ways by providing educational and uh, useful disease information that's related to NMOSD. Uh, these resources could include uh, brochures and uh, website resources, as well as addressing your questions about uh, treatment logistics. Uh, in addition, <clears throat> One source case managers can also help with health insurance navigation uh, in several important ways. For example, they can help with information to understand the insurance plan and coverage options. They can uh, uh, find information on alternative funding options and resources if you have funding concerns or gaps in coverage. In addition, Alexion also has a copay program that helps eligible patients uh, reduce out-of-pocket costs that are related to treatment or infusion. One source also provides ongoing support to help when the treatment location or insurance coverage changes to facilitate smooth transition. And uh, one source can also help with community connections by providing information about in-person and online meetings and events patient support meetings, and advocacy groups. Yuri, thank you so much. Very, very helpful information. Um, we really appreciate it. We'll now ask uh, each of the speakers to join us back on video. And we'll just address a couple of consensus questions that have come in from patients. And then we'll move on to the last part of the, the program. So uh, let me just share screen here. Um, one moment, please. Uh, the, uh, let's see, one second. My monitor just went out. Uh, let me see if I can do something else here. Actually, let me just ask without having the screen up. Uh, we do this real world, this is live uh, TV, so we just uh, will we'll go with it. Um, some of the questions that came in um, had to do with more general um, development uh, of new drugs and new, new trials in the field of NMOSD. And one of the questions has to do with uh, what, if any, trials are going on for use in pediatrics? And um, why don't we just generally um, ask, let's see, Yuri, why don't you, if you wouldn't mind, just answer that question sort of in general with respect to overall uh, events in the field. Thank you, Michael. So as has been discussed already today throughout all three presentations, safety and effectiveness of uh, currently approved FDA treatments for the treatment of NMSD in pediatric patients have not been yet established. <clears throat> However, Alexion is currently conducting a study of the safety and efficacy of aculizumab, which is an active component of Celeris, in pediatric patients with, with relapsing NMOSD. 
The study is recruiting eligible patients who are aged between two and 17 years old. And um, the anticipated study completion date is December 20, 2024. You can find additional information about this trial on clinicaltrials.gov. Thanks, Yuri. Um, another question has to do with um, the potential um, clinical trials or other developments with respect to MOG positive disease or seronegative disease. And in general, in the field, maybe we could just ask Tiffany to address that question. Absolutely. So currently, there are no ongoing studies in MOG positive or seronegative patients. Thank you, uh, Tiffany. And then lastly, the, um, the other question that patients are very interested in, generally in the field, has to do with um, the potential effect or benefit of the approved drugs on pain or cognition. And Maureen, we know you've done some work in this area. Could you just address that one for us, please? Sure, of course. Uh, that's an important question. So in addition to mobility, visual, bowel and bladder dysfunction, pain, pain and cognition um, issues are terrible consequences of this disease that result from previous damage done to the central nervous system during these inflammatory attacks. All three FDA medications are approved for use in aquaporin 4 seropositive NMOSD, and the primary endpoint for each was based on relative reduction of NMOSD attacks. So the goal of each is to reduce the risk of future neurologic damage. However, uh, there is no indication for any of these as a means of correcting previous damage. Symptom management, including pain and cogn cognitive issues, uh, continue to be an important undermet need for patients with NMOSD that these medications do not directly address. That said, there are data being presented from the NMOSD and, and Momentum trial uh, this April at the American Academy of Neurology that suggest pain may not worsen in those treated with Uplisna as it did in those, uh, in those who treat, received placebo. So despite there being no expectation of decreasing pain, reducing the risk of attack may prevent worsening of pain. Thanks a lot, Maureen. Really appreciate that. Uh, and thank you to all the speakers uh, for your excellent uh, information and educational content. We'll now just move on to answer a couple of other questions that came in from patients that are more general, and I'll try to do my best to address these. Um, one question that is, is common is, you know, why are the new medications any better than what is already out there? Why does approval matter? And more importantly, why is it, uh, is it uh, best to use an FDA approved drug, for instance? And there's several reasons that could be considered and these don't um, encompass all possible answers, but I'll just try to offer a few thoughts. First, as you heard today, you know, when a drug receives regulatory approval, that means it's been tested for efficacy in very rigorous conditions. These are very well controlled, what are called prospective randomized clinical trials. And that means a lot of people are very carefully looking to make sure that everyone in the trial is um, carefully uh, characterized, that everyone is, um, is provided the same kind of uh, treatment in terms of uh, it being either placebo or active drug. Um, there's also uh, a, an incredible amount of data analysis and, of course, review by the regulatory experts. So when a drug becomes approved, that means it has met a lot of, uh, of standards. And um, that makes a big difference between an approved drug and a drug that's not approved for NMOSD. Um, also, something to, to, to be aware of is that you know, when clinical trials end officially, that doesn't mean that they, the drugs stop in terms of their being monitored and reviewed for safety and effectiveness. Those tend to go on for a long, long time. So patients who are on approved drugs are often being followed in ways that provide additional safety and efficacy monitoring in ways that drugs that are not approved do not. 
And lastly, uh, approved drugs oftentimes uh, are more likely to receive support from uh, cost uh, standpoints in terms of insurance um, as compared to drugs that are not necessarily approved for NMOSD. Those are just a few thoughts. There's others as well, but it's a great question um, and, and one that we hear a lot. So hopefully that's helpful. Another sort of uh, common question had to do with um, vaccinations and you know, why are vaccines necessary in general? Uh, well, you heard that for a couple of the um, specific uh, uh, um, purposes that were mentioned in the presentations, for example, with eculizumab, uh, meningococcal vaccines are required. Uh, and for the other drugs as well, there are a couple of vaccines that are recommended but not necessarily required. I think the point is that vaccine um, approaches can prevent uh, infections that can otherwise be not only harmful to any of us, but can pot potentially be harmful, especially in the context of NMOSD. So of course, it's best to talk with your doctor about which type of vaccinations uh, and um, when potentially to vaccinate, uh, as really your relationship with your doctor is best to evaluate those kinds of questions. We did hear in the presentations that certain types of vaccines like live vaccines are usually to be avoided in immunosuppression. But again, really talking with your doctor to, uh, to decide which are best for you is the right way to go. And then uh, lastly, um, there's always uh, an increasing interest these days in can a COVID-19 vaccine be taken while on one of these approved drugs? And in general, in theory at least, uh, anytime there's immunosuppression, there's the potential to diminish uh, a vaccine uh, response. However, if you look at the immunology, there's a very good reason to be optimistic that the COVID-19 vaccines um, should provide good, if not excellent, um, protection against disease or severe outcomes with COVID-19. And there are recommendations uh, provided by a number of authoritative bodies, including the Centers for Disease Control, World Health Organization, the American College of Rheumatology, uh, the British Immunological Society, et cetera, all of whom say that the benefits of a COVID-19 vaccine greatly outweigh any potential risks. Again, when to receive a vaccine is really a priority in terms of protecting yourself against the disease. Usually, the sooner the better is what is recommended. But please talk with your doctor uh, and you know, decide for yourself which vaccine and when to use vaccination. Um, as a quick reminder, you see on the screen, and I'll just thank Brian Cords uh, or Lisa uh, behind the scenes for rescuing my monitor. Um, the, uh, the foundation now has on its website some frequently asked questions and answers with respect to immune suppression and vaccination. So please visit the website and you'll find a lot more information there. And last but not least, this really brings us to the conclusion of our program today. All that's really left to say is thank you so much. We want to thank Maureen Neely from Horizon and uh, Tiffany Berwald from uh, Genentech, Yuri Edwards from Alexion for the great information and educational material and content provided today. Uh, we look forward to seeing you again on an upcoming breakout session. And uh, thanks so much. Be safe and we'll talk soon. Thank you, Michael. Thank you very much. Thanks so much, everyone.